Welcome, everybody. Today is Friday, February 12th. This is Michael Bracey with the Music Policy Forum um, just outside of Washington, D.C. I am so excited to welcome you to another edition of Music Policy Forum Live. This is our weekly conversation program where we talk to a uh, wide range of music stakeholders about music and policy and advocacy and activism and industry structures and creating better, more resilient, um, more equitable music industry and all sorts of other things. We are so appreciative that you're spending some of your Friday with us. Uh, we have a great program with some super smart uh, guests that are gonna talk about a, a range of issues as we go through the hour. Um, a couple pieces of quick housekeeping. Again, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, we're so happy you're with us and we hope that you enjoyed today's program. We're gonna, um, throughout the show, put some relevant uh, links and other resources into the chat window so you can kind of follow along uh, with some of the references that we make during the show. If you want to, don't feel obligated. If you want to um, introduce yourself in chat and just let us know who you are and where you're joining us from, we always love to get a sense of who's on the program or who's who's participating uh, within our live audience. Again, this program, like all of our other programs, will be archived on our Music Policy Forum website early next week. So if there's something that you saw today that you found uh, useful or interesting or you want to share with friends or colleagues, uh, we certainly encourage you to do that. Uh, today is our 33rd program, uh, the 33rd Friday that we've uh, we've done this show. Uh, we're really excited. Uh, one of our guests later is Gigi Johnson, uh, who was really an inspiration uh, for me personally in terms of using Zoom, even pre-COVID, starting to think about these technology platforms as ways of uh, really expanding our communication outreach, you know, beyond in person or conference calls. And of course, uh, we met our producer, Alex Dolvin through Gigi and just have so much uh, appreciation uh, for that introduction as well. So it's, it's, it's really fun to think back on all the programming we've done uh, over the past year and, and are looking forward to continuing doing. So if you are stuck with the February blues and are um, homebound this weekend because of bad weather, and want to do nothing but hang out and watch uh, lots and lots of conversations about music and policy and all the other stuff we talk about here. Uh, there's a wealth of resources on the website and uh, the entirety of the 2020 Music Policy Forum intensive is there as well. So as always, before we get into the show, um, I want to uh, provide a couple of updates and some, some general news. Um, big news, you know, in Washington, and, and again, most of the folks watching today's program are keeping an eye on this, uh, but, the, but the House of Representatives is moving forward with marking up the next wave of relief funding. Um, we do not know at this point uh, if the, uh, there have been some rumblings that uh, Majority Leader Schumer in the Senate is looking to add additional resources to the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant Program. Again, we've got a ways to go uh, before we see if there's more money going into that, uh, that pool of funds. What we do know is that there, the House has set aside significant funding for state and local governments um, at the city and county uh, level as well, uh, over a billion dollars going each to cities and to counties. Uh, currently in the House bill, that is going to be on the floor uh, probably in about 10 days, give or take. The um, What's going to be uh, interesting on, on that is as we see cities getting money on a formula basis sort of tied to the community block grant funding uh, formula, that's gonna turn into, you know, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars for cities depending on their size and, and kind of their economic situation. Uh, so those funds not only are gonna shore up local budgets uh, and local government budgets and, and help, uh, you know, take care of some shortfalls, but provide potential new resources that can be put into the art and culture sector. So again, we're all watching that very closely as that bill winds its way through the house and then through the Senate and eventual passage um, which again should be happening in the, probably a month, give or take, we'll see. Um, but it will be coming in right around $1.9 trillion. So more to come on that. Uh, a couple of news and notes and updates uh, just from previous guests and uh, from our community. Uh, many of you participated last November in the Music Policy Forum Intensive. And one of the conversations that you may have seen as part of that conference was a, a conversation with Michael Seaman uh, from Colorado State University and Nick Hart with the Data Foundation here in DC and and uh, and others talking about the role of data in federal policymaking and what we should be sort of thinking about as we moved into the Biden administration. And we've talked to previous programs again 
about Biden administration's commitment to evidence-based policymaking and really trying to uh, connect with data. Uh, I was really excited this week to see uh, something come out from our friends at Being Art Hero, who again uh, have, have, have been on our program previously talking about their advocacy efforts. They worked with Mike Seaman on basically an explainer uh, about NAICS codes, which is a very wonky thing, but basically is the sort of mechanism that the federal government uses to categorize different types of businesses. And one of the complications that we all deal with is that the creative economy tends not to, and creative workers tend not to fit neatly into these uh, job titles or these industry descriptions. And there's an ongoing effort to sort of think about where does the federal government, how does the federal government think about this and categorize this and, and put them into, into different boxes. So Alex has put in the chat a link to the conversation we had in November that touches on the whole notion of NAICS codes and basically the process at the Office of Management and Budget that they go through to basically update those. And that has been turned into an explainer where if you click through, you'll see that a uh, cartoon cat, not the cat lawyer who went viral this week, but a, a different cartoon cat uh, is explaining uh, to the audience what a NICS code is, why it's important for the creative economy and what the process is gonna be to try to get OMB to update that. So we just love to see these sort of things in motion across our community turn it into information and potentially into action. Uh, the other thing I, I wanna flag, um, many of you, uh, I mean, most of you, I, I assume, uh, who are on our program uh, are, are fans and admirers of uh, the recording artist, performer and writer, Dessa. Uh, she was amazing on our show a couple weeks ago. Um, it was uh, announced this morning that Tessa has a brand new podcast that she's done in partnership with BBC and American Public Media um, that will be uh, launching this spring. And uh, again, Alex is going to put the link to that in the chat. Uh, I can't wait. It's, it's Dessa talking about science and the brain and a lot of things that she's been writing about and thinking about for a long time. And that's just going to be a hoot. So um, thrilled for Dessa. Can't wait. Uh, to be uh, for that podcast to debut and uh, to educate me on all sorts of things. So with that, uh, we're excited to move into um, our first segment today. Uh, I'm very, very happy to uh, welcome Zach Rogue into the conversation. Zach, thanks for, for joining us. I need you to turn on your camera and unmute yourself, please. There you are. All right. Sorry about that. This is I'm, a, you know, the, I love that Room Raider uh, Twitter feed. I don't know if you've seen that, where they they basically look at, at you know, they sort of rate people's backgrounds and uh, uh, based on composition and stuff. And you, that is a solid nine out of ten. That's a very good setup you've got there. You got some books. You got some, yeah. some plants. You got some just <laughs> depth there. It's good. I can take no credit. Um, this is I've been in the garage for months, and my wife actually she's been so busy. Um, trying to find places to operate where we are not attacked by our children. And she got this tiny little desk and put it, this is actually my bedroom. <laughs> it, it, I, if it was me doing it, it would have been a blank wall, but she has all this cool stuff, you know, so yeah. I take no credit. <laughs> well, Zach, we're so happy you're with us. And, and uh, for those of you who have not had a chance to, to be uh, fans and appreciators of, of Zach and, his amazing band Rogue Wave. Um, Alex is, is putting a couple links into into the chat, and you can you can definitely check that out. And um, you know, tell us a little bit, Zach, about you know, start. Let's just start with the band. Just tell us a little bit about Rogue Wave. Tell us a little bit about you know some of your history. And what I'm always interested in is kind of as we you know kind of pre-COVID, what were things shaping up like as you were kind of heading into 2020? Yeah, well, if you want to talk band origins, it is kind of interesting because the band Rogue Wave was really born out of, you know, when we had a major economic downturn downturn uh, before, uh, you know, when the, the tech bubble kind of crashed in the Bay Area, I got laid off <laughs> and uh, suddenly found myself with nothing to do. So really the, the band was kind of born out of the ashes of that experience. And I just, you know, I, I flew to a, a New York with a one-way ticket to just kind of focus on on music because I was suddenly jobless and and I didn't expect um, <laughs> certainly at the time for a band to come out but I just wanted to record I hadn't really made my own music really before so uh, you know 
fast forward several months later after working on the record, I used Craigslist, you know, at the time to find band members. And, uh, and, and it really, that's really how I kind of started the band and we started from there. And I think we played every venue in the Bay area, just any gig we could take. And then we, we got extraordinary lucky and got picked up by sub pop, um, in Seattle. And that really kind of, uh, was a shotgun blast and you know got our band going um so it was an unexpected beginning let's just say <laughs> so i didn't expect to be in that position to be in a touring band or you know to really do anything outside of my bedroom <laughs> yeah with my guitar yeah so you know we've we've you know really enjoyed featuring you know recording artists performing artists on our show as often as we can just to kind of check in and like how are you doing? You're like, what, 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 what's the vibe at this point? How are you feeling? I know you've, you've taken to doing some online shows, like what yeah. kind of, where are, what's, what's your head at and your heart at kind of as we were in a month 10 of this thing? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's an evolving thing. I find that, uh, I mean, I'm particularly sad right now because our drummer, Pat Spurgeon from Rogue Wave, he just moved last week and quite frankly, he moved because it's too expensive to live in the Bay Area. I mean, it's virtually impossible for people, you know, people to buy homes right now who aren't extraordinarily affluent. So there's been such cultural flight uh, to the Bay Area, which is really tragic. Um, it's really hurt the, the community culturally in a lot of ways. And um, But for me personally, I've found that uh, it's been a journey. I, I think that I've tried to strike this balance between uh, a few different things um trying to help raise money for others yeah. trying to do things uh to give away just to to people that follow our, our band just purely for fun for art's sake and also i've tried to uh use the different platform if you hear that screaming that's my son um i tried to use the various platforms that are out there also just to drive some semblance of cottage industry revenue towards our band so I've tried to kind of, and I find that when I do a blend of those things, I feel a little bit better. I feel like I have a little bit more agency over, you know, myself, my art, and and just connecting with people. It's, it's funny, you know, prior to the pandemic, I I viewed social media and a lot of those platforms, I had kind of a dim view of them. I felt like I used them out of necessity because I kind of felt like I had to, but I didn't really enjoy using them or feel like I had a sincere mm -hmm. uh, connection with fans. And um, the pandemic actually changed my perception of that and the way I've tried to engage people with, you know, a lot of sincerity and, and being a bit of an open book uh, with no real agenda um, that's helped. And so mm -hmm. I felt like it's really, uh, there's been a lot more conversation. I've been a lot more active with people and trying to give back as much as I, you know, take in. Um, and I can tell you, I mean, I, you know, if you had a question, I'm happy to answer. But the thing that really got me the most excited about the potential of the community, uh, people that listen to our music and just the greater uh, community is not too far into the pandemic. Um, it, it was looking like things were kind of grim. And, you know, we had done some work with Noise Pop, which is a promotional organization in the Bay Area, which is incredible, which has supported us from the beginning. And we were doing some fundraising with them to just um, drive revenue to local venues, um, which was fun. And, you know, we basically did backyard performing in my in my backyard. So the band was all spread out, you know. Um, and so we, we did that. But I was also trying to think about, well, what could we do personally as a band? And... Um, and I felt like, you know, there's so many causes, there's so much need, you know, where do we even start, you know? And so um, one thing we did was um, I had noticed at the time there was this hip hop artist named Aesop Rock and he recorded this EP. I don't know if you saw this campaign, but he recorded this song called Rogue Wave. And that kind of tickled me. I'm like, and there was, you know, when he put it out, there's no mention of us. He just kind of put the song and I, I'm like, that's, that's kind of funny. So um, we recorded a song called Aesop Rock, which... I thought it was kind of funny. And, and, but I thought, you know, we want to do this, but I'm like, how can I do something? How can I use this as a vehicle in some way, rather than just putting out some self-serving single? And so I, uh, I got in touch with a, a publicity agency in New York. And I said, you know, I have this new song and I want to do something with it. You know, what, 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 what can we do? And, and then I started just reaching out to nonprofits uh, I talked to Oxfam. I talked to a lot of national, international organizations. Like this is, I'm just a guy in a band with a song. 
want to help somehow, what can I do? And then I, you know, I talked to guys in the band and I decided um, I want to go local, just, you know, go with who you know and where you're from. And, and so I reached out to this group called Tipping Point, which is the Bay Area based organization. They've been working here for decades, uh, raising money directly to families in need. And I, I just started having meetings with them and going, going on to some of their, you know, conference calls. And uh, one, actually, one of the first ones was, was with Gavin Newsom, which was kind of interesting. Um, and I started working with them. I got the agency involved. And, uh, you know, I got an incredible artist to do all this artwork for it. And we put it out and uh, raised a bunch of money. You know, people really wanted to be involved. And, and I thought to myself, okay, what else can we do here? And I started putting playlists together of my favorite uh, bands in the Bay Area, who are the most significant to me or, you know, legacy artists, new and emerging artists. And I put these playlists together and I started reaching out to bands on social media. and like, hey, this is something we're doing. If you're interested, please uh, spread the word. And they did. They really did. And so much money was raised for Tipping Point, going directly to families. Um, I mean, there is a self-serving nature to it. I mean, we were getting attention for having a new single, but there's all this revenue being directed towards this group and it, it felt good. Um, and I really kind of pushed it. Um, there's this group called the Lonely Island. You know, they do like comedy. I'm sure you've seen their skits and they do movies. And yes. they, put, they put out before the pandemic this, this joke uh, mini uh, film about uh, the, these, these players on the A's. And it was this really funny video, music video. And I put that song on our playlist and I just reached out to them like, hey, you know. And they responded, they donated, they got their fan base to be involved in this tipping. And so these things work together. And what starts as like a joke with Aesop Rock kind of blossomed. And it was just, it was fun. It was engaging. There was great art with it. And it just made me feel like we had some purpose. And I feel like we reached beyond our fan base, reached a little farther, but really benefited our own community. So I felt human for a minute. That's so neat, Zach. And, and I think that's part, I mean, it's, it's, you know, we're all living through this in real time. And so it's really hard to be sort of like in the moment and then also like trying to figure out what's happening, like at a different level. But, you know, I just think back to, you know, you and I first connected, you know, a long time ago around like Pat, your drummer had health issues and <laughs> your band pre Obamacare is doing a lot of work, just helping people understand that, you know, working artists and working musicians can't get health insurance and, you know, the structural yeah. things. And you, Think about the challenges of communicating a message, any message, you know, mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago, if you're trying to do community-based advocacy work uh, or messaging work and like where we are now, I mean, it, it is overwhelming and exhausting, just all the noise, but it also just to your point allows us to do things that we, you know, just even things like today's show, like this isn't something we would have thought about doing, you know, on Zoom yeah. a couple years ago. So it, it is incredible, actually, you bring up that point, because there was a documentary made about Pat, it's called Detour, if anyone wants to see it, uh, the letter D and then Tour, I think you can find it on Vimeo, there's a channel, uh, maybe Alex, or I, I can send a note after, but um, it's incredible how relevant, I mean, that, mo that film was made 13 years ago, I think, and it's still so relevant, and, you know, Michael, you and I have talked about this at great length, but the pandemic is a mirror, it's a mirror uh, in, in so many ways. Take any industry, any aspect of our lives and what uh, our, our country was designed for and what it wasn't designed for. Um, and healthcare is, is, you know, obviously, you know, artists, um, you know, like myself and others, you know, healthcare and access to healthcare, uh, mental health care, it's very hard to come by. And Pat, uh, you know, and for those of you who don't know, Pat was uh, born with a a failing kidney. He, and when our band really kind of started getting going, we're really touring on the road. He, uh, his kidney, his second kidney um, failed. And so he was doing dialysis while we were on tour and peritoneal dialysis, which allows you to do it, you know, on the go. And the film documents our kind of struggles to try, because when you do dialysis, it has to be in a very kind of sterile environment. And for anyone who's been on tour before, not very sterile. So, um, and then the film dovetails in a lot of other issues. Um, one of our band members uh, died during the, the, you know, the making of the film and, you know, his organs were, you know, it's, it's, 
it's an incredible movie, but it does, it goes back to the point that you're absolutely right. Oh, thank you, Alex, for putting that in there. Um, it's a great movie. And it really kind of shows how we don't place a lot of value. We may place a lot of value uh, intrinsically on the, you know, how much we like art and artists, but in terms of the protection they need, and it really has left Pat and a lot of other people like him who have pre-existing conditions through no fault of their own with very little ability. You know, if, if you need anti-rejection medication, you're a musician, you're really stuck in this limbo in which if you receive a certain amount of money through any kind of work, then you don't have any protection anymore. And he's been in this limbo ever since. And, um, you know, it's tough, it's challenging. Well, and, and, you know, it makes me think, I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to have you on this week is, and, and I'm going to ask you sort of an impossible question because it's very open-ended. So I apologize, you know, in, in advance, but Again, this notion of, of what I said before that, you know, as people have been thinking about music and the structures of the music community and policy and how to reform for a long time. And, and it's, it, you know, one of the things that happened in the past year is this sort of explosion of advocacy and organizing and, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, self-advocacy in a way that we, we've never seen before. And so you have Neva, you have NIDO, you know, on the talent organization side, you, you have you know, be an arts hero, you have, you know, the folks that we, we showcased last week in terms of, you know, the cultural advocacy group and, and people either have been in the sector for a long time or people who are brand new to the sector, all sort of embracing, you know, what is kind of a hackneyed cliche, but this whole notion of, you know, build back better, right? I mean, it's kind of a silly slogan, but it also is sort of a challenge, you know, not only to our country about everything we do in this country, but about our industry ourselves. And I just wonder if you have any reflection as someone who's been in the community, someone who's been community minded for a long time. I and mean, we've always been sort of engaged in, in, in that intersection of music and social justice and nonprofit support. And also thinking about like, what, is, what does it mean to you to see the sort of explosion of, of self-advocacy and, and organizing efforts? Well, you know, I, I, and I, I've talked to you about this before when you see the contrast between our country and other countries in terms of how they value uh, through policy um, art and how it's funded and, and, uh, and it is striking, you know, on the indie rock level, you know, opening bands have been making the same amount of money for 25 years. <laughs> Things have not changed very much. And so when I see, and also, and it, we haven't been that well organized. And when I see what Neva has accomplished, uh, that level of, of, um, taking action, being organized, the communication, and being able to kind of galvanize um, a lot of these venues together that have been pretty disparately disassociated from one another. Um, it gives me a lot of encouragement. Yeah. And just, you know, on, just on the purely, and I know I've been talking about local stuff here, but what I've seen is, you know, when these groups organize effectively, when they make enough noise, you do see some change. I mean, there was legislation that was proposed in December maybe it was late November, December to kind of help local venues because there was no one knew what was going to happen in the election. And there was, you know, it, you know, there was a lot of speculation, but there wasn't a lot of awareness about um, what the next uh, round of funding was going to be. And most small venues are kind of left in the lurch. And so we saw something passed. I think it was yesterday, the day before it actually went through. There's some rescue funding in San Francisco. And is it going to be a, a, is there a totality to its level of bridge funding to really rescue all venues? No, it's limited. But I think we got there because a lot of venues were making noise. You know, what I've learned through revs and what we, we find, and I think if we prove the point that venues don't just have this existential benefit to people because music is great. We know that it's great. But when we also present a case that without these venues, you know, these venues anchor these economic communities. And so when we present the case in that way, and make a lot of noise unapologetically, I think we find ourselves in a better position. And um, like I said before, it is a mirror. When we see these venues closing, it's, it's shocking. Yeah. It's shocking because we always thought they'd be there, even though they've been so, so demeaned. And the venues that don't own their own buildings that are paying rent, you know, they're in a really difficult situation, obviously, and, and we have to fight for that funding. Yeah. Well, Zach, we always love hearing from you. Um, February 17th, the next all request show. That's right. And that's check that out. Yeah. I'm doing an all request. Yeah. I've been using this uh, platform called moment house. They're kind of a new streaming platform, uh, but it's, it's great. You know, artists can kind of, they get to keep all the contacts and people 
submit their email, but it's, it's been a great channel for me. I keep the ticket price low and it's, it's fun. It's, it's like a weekly or bi-weekly get together and um, it's, it's a good time. Cottage right. industry. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All righty. Zach, it's always great to see you. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the work you're doing on revs and, and everything else. So we'll talk soon. Right. And now um, I'm thrilled to bring in Gigi Johnson and Storm Glore. Hey guys. Howdy. Greetings. How are you? from Denver. So um, we're going to, uh, in a minute or two, pivot into the next segment of our conversation, which actually is a great bridge with what Zach was talking about, because it's the whole sort of the emerging role of, of music industry education in terms of empowering the next generation of industry leaders and how we're going to all soldier through this together. But but before we bring in the full panel, I, I do want to, and Gigi, at the beginning of the show, I thank you for all of your help for getting this program started and connecting with Alex and all the rest of that stuff. But you guys are, are scheming the 2021 version of the Amplify Conference. And, and that's a, an event we we're proud to be part of last year and will be a part of this year. But I just want you all to spend a minute or two talking about what you have in store for Amplify for folks who uh, maybe are not tapped in yet to what you all are doing. Do you want to just spend a minute or two and explain what's up this year? Sure, I'll, I'll kick that off. So Amplify was inspired a little bit and a lot by Mr. Bracey here in the fact that we kept running into all these people like Michael, like Kate, who's I know uh, listening on this. Hey, Kate, uh, and other people who who we thought were amazing, but then other people didn't know them. And then this kept going and kept going and kept going that there were so many ecosystems of people that were out there all emerging solutions right and this is this is when neva was getting launched this is when all these groups were getting launched so uh storm and i were supposed to be talking about how all these cities weren't talking to each other all that well other than certain ecosystems for south by a year ago and then we said well since south by is canceled let's have the conversation so um insanely we decided then to do a 25 hour around the clock conference on zoom about 2 a.m. we thought, what the heck? So this year we are instead disaggregating the conference. We're bringing the group back together again. And um, I know Alex has put the main link on the uh, on the chat. We're also have Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups. Tickets are available. Who that was good, Alex. And so then uh, we are uh, disaggregating it. We're doing three half days of conversations about 20, what, 2021 in the future as well as we're having city sessions. And the first one's going to be Denver, um, looking at what's happening in cities all over the world between a few weeks from now and the fall, so that you don't have to set up um, in the middle of the night and be seeing what's happening in India. You might still, uh, but you can tour the world from your sofa. And we're hoping that you know, on the music education side, that universities, scholars, students, uh, people wanting to rebuild their own careers from all over the world can participate. Storm, I know I talked too much. What did I miss? Well, you know, I, I'll just look on on the other side of that uh, that conference. That yeah, Gigi and I put that together so quickly that uh, you know there were probably some voices we didn't have at the table because we were moving at such a rapid speed. So. We, this year, we'll have some uh, additional guests that, that maybe we didn't get to earlier. And there, there have been, you know, back then, we thought this would be over in September of last year. You know, what we didn't know uh, so early in the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, we, we couldn't work with. So I think we, we've got uh, some additional programming this time and, and some additional voices and some additional folks at the table. Really looking forward to, to that collective um, and, uh, and yeah, the, the city focus, uh, I think will be a result of that to better, uh, a better, um, scheduling of all the events rather than that 25 hour marathon. So. <laughs> well, it's going to be a great event and we're happy to, again, support it any way that, that we can and, and, and look forward to learning a lot. Um, so thank you for that. And. And now um, I want to bring in my MPF co-founder and good friend, Anna Chalenza. Um, Anna and I have had the, I've had, not Anna has, I've had the enormous privilege of working with Anna. Uh, in I've had the privilege to. A music industry course at Georgetown for the last five years. And, you know, for me personally, it's been, you know, such an, a, a, an important compliment to the advocacy work that, uh, you know, we do here because, you know, when you have to get in front of a live audience of 25 
really smart, really motivated people who care deeply about music and the future of the community, you know, you really have to be able to, to, to be intentional about how do you talk about things? How do you talk about issues? How do you, you know, does it land? Is it connecting? And then how does that fit into the context of their experiences as young people who have a fundamentally different relationship to music and to technology and to the consumer marketplace and all the, the sort of policy, you know, touch points that we talk about in history and the fact that the Tele Telecommunications Act, you know, is older than most of our students and all these different things are, are, are such a, you know, a remarkable sort of check on, you know, the work that I do and others. And, and so today we, we are so happy to have this conversation because, you know, we talk constantly about building better structures, building a more resilient and equitable industry. Um, and, and, and that, in, in, in my mind, is inextricably linked with the generational handoff of, of, of power and authority and control. And so, Anna, I asked you to come in and help lead this conversation. Um, Gigi or Storm, would you mind introducing Armin and Clyde in terms of, you know, their, their kind of role in the community? And, and then we just kind of just get it going. I don't know. Sure. Uh, I, when I first decided to get into music business education, Clyde Ralston was a name given to me as someone I needed to meet very quickly. And that was a long time ago. And, and since then, Clyde has always impressed me with the way he's, he and, and Belmont have, have changed to meet the needs of students through the years. And Clyde's a, a, an awesome, awesome teacher. And, and he's created new curriculum and is always on the leading edge of what's going on. And uh, uh, Armin actually uh, succeeded me as president of MIA and has just done amazing things with the organization, especially given last year when, when you know, he had to deal with a conference that was scheduled to be in person in Washington, D.C., uh, and, and not only has put together an awesome conference with his team, and, and they've created some awesome new programming uh, around MIA, and, and I, hopefully he'll mention that, but two great folks we've got here with us. Why don't we just start kind of big, big picture and, and Armin, maybe as since you're president of MIA, this would be a good one for you just to start with. I mean, for those in, in today's program that have not really been part of this particular niche, part of the sector, what is MIA and how do you sort of conceive of or, t or think about what this kind of field is? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for having me, Michael. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, MIA is the Music and Entertainment Industry Educators Association, and it was formed in uh, 1979, so about 41 years ago, uh, I believe from some folks at Belmont and some other schools that really wanted a way to connect as music industry education was slowly starting to take shape. Um, I think as a field overall, we're still kind of new uh, when you look at any other, uh, you know, university majors out there. And so ever since then, we've had an annual summit that usually takes place uh, historically the week after South by Southwest because folks would come to uh, uh, Austin and then a lot of international academics as well. And then they would stay around that week and join me at wherever it would be held. Started out in Nashville. Now we rotate between Nashville, Nashville LA and uh, Washington, D.C. because there's so much going on on the legal front. Um, and as Storm mentioned, we were due to have our in-person summit of over about 130 attendees about two days before DC shut down for COVID. So it was a bit of a scramble there. Um, but we've pivoted to online. Mia has an annual journal that it's had for over 40 years. Um, it's a resource for folks in the entertainment industries in academia. It's a way for a tenure track and other researchers to get their voices heard, to publish research. Um, the summit is really great. We really mix industry with academia. So we have folks presenting their research and then we bring in keynote speakers from all over the industry. Uh, we do annual legal updates, especially nowadays when there's so much going on. And so as Storm mentioned, we had to pivot to online like most other folks. And um, out of that became uh, a, a regular event called Mia Meets. We, we just had ours two hours ago. Um, and it's kind of a, every other week or once a month. And it's just on a you know, topic that's current and we ask folks to join us and we've actually had a lot of success with that. We have folks from Australia and Sweden uh, that joined us today as well. So um, it's truly an international organization and we're still uh, growing actually quite a bit in Latin America and Spain uh, as well. 
So can I jump in with a quick question, yeah. Michael? Because um, thank it, it's first of all, I think it's incredible work. It's so important to have like a place where we can all come together. And I'm curious, you know, when you look at these conferences and meetings, it's a great place over the years to see how the industry is changing and how does education change. I was wondering if all of you could speak to changes you've seen in the last, say, two to three years. Things that, 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 you're, that you're presenting differently or interests that students have that seem to be a little bit new. Of course, with COVID, I'm assuming, too, there, there are changes to be made. I wonder, Clyde, do you want to jump in on that? Uh, yes, thank you. And, um, I, you know, as a senior statesman here, I guess, a long-term MIA uh, member, uh, I have seen a lot of change. And in the early days, it seemed like we had a lot of faculty from a few schools. And now we have a lot of faculty from a lot of schools um, and, and maybe the numbers of people attending from, you know, Belmont and University of Miami, MTSU might be a little smaller. But there's been a lot of growth, not only in the United States, but worldwide of music business programs. And so we're attracting, uh, you know, faculty and industry folks uh, from, you know, all over the world to uh, attend and, and participate in the, uh, in the conference. And I think that's been, you know, the, the major change um, is just the, the growth. And, and despite, you know, downturns in the industry, um, you know, the education portion of it has continued to grow pretty steadily. Yeah. I mean, I would say at Georgetown, I think Michael and I can both attest to this, um, just monitoring our students' uh, interests, what they listen to, has exploded. Like it used to be there were always like these same 10 people that would pop up on the first day survey. And now we get, you know, everybody has completely different artists that they're listening to. So there's a wide range in there. And then, you know, another thing I'm curious about uh, uh, with this is uh, I am noticing we're getting many more students from the business school who are wanting to be a part of the entertainment industry more so than performers that are taking the courses to like promote their career. And so I'm wondering if you all, maybe, you know, we're an outlier, but I'm just curious, what are you seeing with these topics in the last few years, what in students are interested in, Gigi? Um, I come from the business school side at UCLA <laughs> where I taught for, for 10 years. So I was teaching a mix of students and then came to the music school. And I do feel like in some ways the students are kind of catching up. But I do think that the students I was teaching 10 years ago, I was teaching an advanced music marketing class and we scramble like the Dickens to stay advanced as everything moves forward, is that it was many more artists who were trying to figure out how to be creative with their management and how not to get screwed over. That's kind of where our portfolio was. And now we just launched a new music history and industry program and had triple the number of creatives or of applicants that we thought we'd have, but uh, creatives who wanted to be a bit of everything, not going label side necessarily, but they wanted to understand how they could be a singer songwriter and have a career in management and go work for a, a small label and and have a real portfolio of options, not the, it's, you know, uh, it's Interscope or bust. It, it's a, and maybe that's because we have a history bent to it as well. So it's folks who really want to understand the, the space of it all, et cetera. So maybe that's also, we're getting that. Uh, but I am finding students who are, who are much more entrepreneurial and much more wanting to build something, not just have a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely the case. Armin, any? I didn't want. I didn't want to leave you out of the conversation there. Oh no, um, I, I, I actually the. I just now that I, I listened to Gigi, I'm actually the opposite of hers because my my degrees are in classical piano performance. So I come from the music side, and I'm at University of South Carolina now. And my department is uh, sport and entertainment management, and it's actually one of the top rated sport management programs in the world. We have tons of international students, and over seventy percent of our uh, student uh, body is from out of state. And I think my program at this point has over 1,200 majors and 800 minors. So I'm more of in a, in a management college. Uh, so none of my students, they all love music, but I don't have any musicians in my program. So I miss my musician friends um, a little bit. Uh, all of my coworkers and colleagues are in the business field. Um, but I'm really seeing these students being excited. I am seeing much more entrepreneurial 
ideas and um, just what the students want to study. And so it's exciting to see the music fans be here essentially and want to work in the industry. So it's a, it's a little different perspective on my end. So I want to build on something that we kind of referenced a minute before, and, and I would just love y'all's perspective on this. Um, the tension between being sort of an instructor and sort of saying, this is how things are, this is what you need to know. And again, this emerging generation that are like, what's the first time you heard about TikTok, right? I mean, like, you know, people who are sort of have an understanding of the future of the industry that might be different than my generation would be. And, and how do you navigate that as educators, you know, sort of feeling the need to, again, share your expertise and your knowledge, but also be open to the, the fact that our industry is changing so rapidly that they're in some ways going to be more expert than we are on certain elements of this stuff. Is that a, a tension that you see a lot in the field? I think you really have to recognize the, the students' involvement uh, in the industry. And I, you know, in my marketing class, one of the very first things I'll, I will tell them is I am not an expert in this field, you know, because it's just too broad and it's changing too fast. And there's not one way to do this right. So, you know, you're interning at a, at a record label, share your experience because, you know, I may tell you how we did it at my record company or, you know, how somebody else is doing it, but you may be doing, you know, something completely different. So, uh, you know, tell me uh, your experience. And, you know, when it comes to the internet, I don't spend eight hours a day surfing for, you know, the, the latest, you know, music and that kind of thing. And so I, you know, I try to get them to, uh, participate and contribute because that way I'm learning, you know, hopefully as much as they are. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that I have 60 researchers a year going out and doing the research and bringing it back to class. And that's my design is that they're off, you know, I can tell them what happened last year. And then, uh, and then I send them off and then bring executives in. I mean, that's what's great about Zoom right now. Goodness gracious, I have a couple of execs from around the world who come in and participate with my students each week. But I have students out deeply researching existing companies and talking with them online and teaching other students that way. That's my entire course design. They don't want to hear from me. Goodness gracious. They want to hear from each other and they want to hear from top execs who you know, are, are excited to come to class. And of course, I'm sitting in Los Angeles. So I've got students who already have been playing out for years and they've been already interning and they bring all that with them. So that's the joy of it. And, and yes. I would add, I would add that, uh, you know, I, we, we keep the fundamentals in mind. I mean, social media has specific strategies that are going to work no matter what the platform is. And, and, and uh, as, as was mentioned, this thing changes so quickly. The joke in our the joke in our field is that any textbook that is made is is outdated the moment it goes to print, oh. and um, and and so you know as long as we're keeping the soft skills in mind that they need to keep, uh, you know, focusing on as as they deal in their internships and in their courses, and as long as we're keeping in mind, you know, that it's TikTok now it might be Clubhouse a year from now, whatever we it, we still have to understand the basic strategies and 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 modes behind each of those deliveries. Well, and I mean, I'm going to jump in and say that I also think you all shouldn't sell yourselves completely short in that we have already experienced many decades of the music industry that they were not around for. And I think there is something to be said with not trying to reinvent the wheel every time. So to give a perspective of what's happened, what worked and what didn't. And also with the issues of like these systemic issues that cause that are really coming to the fore right now with systemic racism and gender issues and, um, you know, bringing people in from the industry and having them talk gives them a chance to say like this is what this is an issue that's come up that's not really working well and we should have seen it coming and I think mm -hmm. it's good for students to kind of you know talk be, be be ready to look for to critique their own world as opposed to just um yeah playing just saying everything's great and how do I get a job and how do I monetize this um so I mean I'm curious that's part what, of what yeah. uh I was excited uh, I think I froze. I'm sorry. We can hear you. Okay, I'll sorry, go. I totally froze. Go ahead, Annie. Go. 
No, I was going to say, I mean, I think that this is a responsibility of us too. And I think um, with the conferences that you all are doing, that was one of the things, Gigi, uh, that was most exciting in, in Storm is to see that there was real representation and there wasn't that the industry is a bunch of, you know, no offense, but, you know, 50 year old white guys. I mean, it was, I white guys, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's, that's great, but there's more than that. So, but yeah. that was exciting. And for students to see that, just to see the face that pops up on the screen of someone who's working in the industry to, to make that connection. I think that's important. I don't know if you want to talk about how, how do you, how do you build that, you know, when you're thinking about guests and thinking about the conference, Gigi. I just want to, May make two comments on that. One is that I, I'm a big BS detector personally. So for me, part of my goal in teaching is to get my students to take the, the rose colored glasses off and see what's happening under the hood. And this past quarter, I had my students uh, nicely going after one of my guests about how in the world they hire diversely. And it was not something at all that the guests thought they would have to deal with. But you know, if you're trying to look at fit in a small entertainment company, what is that code for? And the students did a beautiful job of having that conversation. And I don't know if they would have been that comfortable doing it. Um, I, th I we, We're looking for more representation, more diversity of, of voices. And it is kind of a hard conversation to have. Um, I, the thing I was going to comment, which is a bit of a twist on that, is I can't get students to go to these events. And it, not just our students, but, you know, Digital Entertainment Week's going on this week. Uh, Storm and I are, because of Amplify, speaking at, I don't know, 10, 15 events this past year, and I'm not seeing anyone's students there, or maybe I'll see five across the entire thing. So I would love to see our students actually going out and seeking things outside the norm, because it's all digital and essentially mostly free. And, um, you know, to me, I'd like them to go see more diverse things than what they see, both in terms of other people's voices, but even other areas of the business. And I don't know what you guys are all seeing as to, you know, I, part of it, there's a glut of stuff going on. But in this era, you can't wait for someone to tap you on the shoulder that, that there's so much going on where you could be immersed. And I think in part, we're still creating the boxes a little too tight. Mm -hmm. And students are wanting a tighter box. So somehow to blow this up more is one of my big goals. Yep. Anyone else? Any any insights into that? How do you all get your students outside the box? Uh, it's, you know, one of the things, and I've been teaching at Belmont since 94, and one of my observations is that the, the recent crop of students doesn't have the same uh, initiative that they did when I started. And, you know, um, I don't know how we fix that, but I certainly would like to encourage students, you know, not to wait until you get your diploma to start getting into the business. And, um, yeah, it, I, I see this just in, in, in the way my advisees lean on me for information that's easily accessible. And, and the same thing is true in the industry. And, you know, you don't have to wait for us to cover it in class to go out and find all this stuff. And, you know, as Gigi said, there's tons of events going on that you can participate in. You know, just because you're a student doesn't mean that you're not welcome. Yeah, and I, I wonder how much of this, um, if COVID is also um, affecting this, because yes, it's easy to jump online to a Zoom event, but I know that like Michael and I always incorporate, until COVID happened, um, we incorporated a conference, which was like at the university, bringing all these people in that was a core of the class and the students loved it. They came, they stayed, you know, all two days and they networked like crazy because they'd sit down and they start talking with someone. And I do think there is a, a level of shyness that, that has happened because of COVID like that they'll, they might even be on, but how do you connect with someone if you don't already know them? And I, I'm wondering if you all have had any like attempts at trying to overcome that. Like how do you network on, on uh, in zoom? Or have you done that with your classes? Yeah, I well, can just kind of, I, yeah. I was, I was just going to jump in and say, I know, I know with Zoom, especially since, you know, it's been over about a year now and, and some students, it's just hard and they're, they're just kind of zoomed out. We are back to campus, uh, part of our courses and mine are both in person this semester. Um, but when I do have a Zoom guest speaker, I let them know that they have to look their best and they have to make sure their room is clean and they're all going to have their camera on. 
And that's just a rule I have. And, you know, there's a little bit of back and forth on that. Is it appropriate? Are we allowed to require that? But to me, you know, we're teaching management and I think you, you have to be presentable. And I'm very big on that in my courses. And I always have my students reach out to the guest speaker, either with a thank you note or if they're interested in internships. So I think there's a few different ways to engage them. Um, it's certainly harder if, if we allow them to leave the camera off and just tune in. Because then when the class is over and I say bye, and 20 minutes later, there are still four students logged on, I know that they're out doing something else. They're not even in the class. So, so this is why I've, I, I've just kind of created some requirements around that. Yes, yeah, Storm, I thought you were going to jump in there. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, it, it, it's pretty obvious that, that Zoom has changed the way we have to teach uh, and, and the way we have to engage students. And I'm a faculty fellow here at the University of Colorado at Denver and work with faculty throughout the university on this. And, and so it's not something, of course, just that we experience in the music business. It's, it's true everywhere. And, and um, Armin mentioned some strategies, but they're pretty, the students are pretty open uh, about their frustrations and, and wanting to to meet the other people in class. And frankly, I, I would think we'd all say that that's one of the, the, the important things about our programs is that, you know, the students get to meet their possible, possibly the partner that they will start a business with, possibly their future boss, possibly their future employee. And that, that part is, very, it's very important for us to try to engage as much as we can, but it is, it is absolutely challenging. Uh, with Zoom and and there's there's a number of publications out there and, and tip sheets and things like that, but ultimately it comes down to yeah, the students. One one of them told me he was taking a shower during my lecture and, and missed the quiz. And I, okay, all well, right. Um, so yeah. yeah, Gigi, you had you were gonna say something. I was just going to say there's other places to go as well. So we're not the only fonts of wisdom. And I put in the chat that Music Biz has their next gen U coming up and they have been having regular sessions. And that's just one a couple of days ago. There's just absolutely wonderful. And a lot of it is students want to hear from people closer to their age. I get that feedback all the time. I'll bring in, this is the CEO of blah, blah, blah company. They go, that's nice. He's like 40. So, um, <laughs> You know, there's there's opportunities to hear other voices. So uh, Music Biz has great programs. And then House of Blues Music Forward has launched their stuff again. And and they're working with folks extensively, um, you know, similar stuff that uh, Grammy in the classroom um, is having a bunch of programs. They had 8,000 people uh, participate in their last round of programs. Normally they had like 800. So uh, there is ways that people can be with their peers or a peer-based program and listen to younger voices of, of us of us old folks are not the interesting place to go. So, And if I can just reach out, there's something Michael and I did this last year, and I'll just throw it out there if you guys want to try it. Um, you all have, you know, lots of people that you've invited in the past, and I'm assuming a deep alumni groups. Um, I when, when we couldn't do the conference, I just reached out to Georgetown alumni that are working in the industry and said, I, my students aren't going to get a networking opportunity. If I hook you up with a student, would you have a half hour one-on-one -on -one Zoom call? And every single person did it. And all the students loved it. And they made that connection and they kind of left the class going, wow, I was really able to network. I didn't think I would do that on Zoom. So, I mean, it, just throwing it out there, Michael and I had a lot of success with that. Yeah. And that's a great way to get virtual internships also. that We kicked <laughs> off a lot of them pulling our alumni and past speakers in and said, hey, you're trapped at home. Would you like an intern to work with? And so that was also a great connective tool. So I want to broaden out and, you know, ask sort of a, a more difficult, you know, question about, you know, just higher education in general and the sustainability and affordability and the utility of higher education. I have two children in college, a third will be uh, starting next year in college. So we're living through it, you know, in my family. And, you know, again, you know, a lot of what we talk about in this program are big structural challenges. And certainly the entire model of, of higher ed um, is a challenge. And I, I just would love to get your, your take on, um, I mean, either just broadly, sort of what you would like to see happen or think we need to, you know, some of the challenges that we need to, to try to address around access and affordability and taking on student debt and all those issues. And related to that, if you have sort of internal sort of guiding sort of like metrics for success or what are the expectations that a student coming out of your program, what are you hoping they're able to, 
you know, sort of get into professionally, like, how do you think about that sort of, you know, what does it mean for a person to come out of your program um, and feel like it was a really good investment of their time and money? So those are like 14 questions, but if there's anything in there anybody wants to take a shot at. Well, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take, I'll make two points in regard to that, Michael. And one is, you know, it, it's sort of ironic that we're, we're here talking about the music industry and there was a great article. I wish I could give, provide a link or a reference, but there was a great article that I read recently through the higher, uh, Chronicle of Higher Ed that compared actually what is happening in academia to what happened in the music business in the late 90s when there was disruption in the form of digital downloading and, and piracy and things like that and understanding how these disruptions that we're experiencing in, in, in education um, are, are very similar in the ways that we have to change our model uh, to fit what uh, students are looking for. And then the second thing is just demographically speaking, uh, we are, I, you know, for anyone here, we may, may or may not know that uh, we're looking at a, a, a much smaller population of 18 to 19 year olds and high school graduates coming up as a result of, you know, back in the 2008 eight recession, people stopped having children. So we're about to hit, a, 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 we're, we're gonna get a double whammy here of the pandemic and that uh, much smaller population of, of high school graduates, which are, you know, a, a large part of the market for students. So. It's, it's interesting, the, the, um, the analogy to that. And so we are having to change the way we teach, uh, the, the programming is the way we take care. Of, you know, here at CU Denver, we have a first year student program uh, that, that really uh, focuses on new students and making sure that they get through that first year successfully because that's when we lose a lot of students. But we're, we're definitely having to, to, to change the way we're looking at things. Mm -hmm. Another thing. Another change in, in uh, education that probably impacts uh, a school like Belmont, uh, you know, private institution where the, the tuition is relatively high, is the number of states that offer free or cheap uh, two years of community college. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the bargain shopping uh, parents have been into, you know, onto this for a while, but now it's, it's really being institutionalized. Um, and it's great for the students, you know, because you can save a lot of money by taking a lot of those gen ed courses someplace else before you transfer to, you know, a private school where the tuition costs are, are, you know, probably maybe four or five times what, you know, state school uh, might be. So we're seeing a lot more uh, students coming in, transferring, and we've had to adjust our, our course offerings uh, to accommodate those students. So we now offer our first two music business classes as half semester courses. Hmm. You can take those two classes in one year, and if you've transferred in as a, a junior, uh, you're catching up really quickly. Hmm. Another thing that's changed a lot with COVID is international students were in some ways the fuel for a lot of what we're doing and that, that dance is gone or it's shifted to other countries. So if you're able to do remote classes, then that's a whole nother beast. Uh, another thing is FAFSA applications year over year are for incoming freshmen are down again. So we thought this was a one year gap where there was a um, 22% decrease in community college entering students and a double digit decrease in public for uh, four year universities. This may be year two of that, not just bumping kids out a year. I, I was just going to close because I know we're, we're at the end of the time, but commenting about, you know, do you need a music industry degree, minor, whatever to be in this industry? And I do think that there's no. And I do think that there's a, uh, uh, a challenge, and I've had long talks with the House of Blues folks who are looking at this issue about the fact that why should you have to pay tuition to get a free internship? So you're, you're, you're essentially giving your time away as well as paying tuition, and that makes it for families who have lesser incomes or, or chronically lesser incomes. You're, you're in a game that is hard to win. So I do think that finding alternate pathways is something there's quite a few organizations that have been working on in communities that you know, right now we've got this odd addiction to the free academic internship, which makes the kids essentially pay twice. 
And if you've got kids putting themselves through school with, with part-time jobs or, or um, it, it doesn't make sense. And so I, I can, what? that's a long soapbox I'll get off of. Yeah. No, not at all. But I think I will say, I also though think that we as faculty can go to our universities and say, we should be able to let these, these internships count without paying credit. I mean, that, that, that there are some schools that have done that. And I think, you know, that I think that's important that you do the internship or maybe even that there's funding that pay the students cost of living over the summer while they do their internships. And I think that's something that we as faculty can step forward and try to make that systemic change within our various colleges and universities. That's, um, yeah, no, I think that's such an important issue. I'm so glad you, you both flagged it. And, and as Gigi mentioned, we are um, at time and this conversation obviously could go a lot deeper and a lot longer. And so I apologize that we you know are gonna kind of have to wrap at this point. I mean, a couple other related issues that all fit into the broader ecosystem. Again, we, we talk a lot about what is gonna happen with the Biden administration. Uh, we have a lot of confidence that the Department of Education is gonna be re-engaging around arts education at the K-12 level which is hopefully going to, you know, really uh, have a lot more people coming out of high school with more sort of engagement and, and, and sort of a tactile sense of the music industry or interest in that. We have the whole community's development field, which we talk a lot about uh, on this program and organizations I know in Denver, Youth on Record is working hard on thinking about equity in the industry and sort of how to, you know, reform, uh, you know, from a COID kind of perspective. And again, that hopefully is filtering into um, this academic field as, as people are coming in with uh, a lot of new ideas. And, and hopefully, as we talked about with Zach, you know, just a sense of um, urgency and opportunity that we don't just have to be passive in the face of these structures, but that these students who are passionate about the industry feel agency and, and the ability to change the industry and to, you know, build, a, a, you know, kind of build different structures or better structures or, or, or a different, you know, sort of way of thinking about things. So, um, thank you so much to all of our guests today. Thank you, uh, as always, to Alex Dolvin. And thank you, Gigi, one more last time for connecting us with Alex, uh, doing a great job producing this. As I said before, if uh, you have any uh, interest in sharing this uh, session with friends or colleagues or want to look at any of our previous 32 programs or Music Policy Forum Intensive, all that stuff lives on our archive. If you have questions, concerns, comments, suggestions, and gently worded constructive criticism, you can always email us at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from all of you. Have a great and safe weekend. Happy Mardi Gras, and we will see you next Friday. Thanks, everybody.